south coast of Wellington in the Island Bay neighborhood and we're overlooking the Cook Strait and we can see all the way to the northern part of the South Island with the Kaikota Ranges in the background. Right underneath our feet right here is actually the Hikarangi subduction zone and that's where the Pacific Plate is diving down beneath the North Island and the boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North Island is about 25 kilometers beneath our feet here where we're standing. The Hikarangi subduction zone is New Zealand's biggest plate boundary fault and probably its largest source of earthquakes and tsunami. Subduction zones release about 80% of global seismicity. So subduction zones are the beasts that generate a lot of the big earthquakes and they're responsible for the largest earthquakes on the planet. Our project began literally a month before the Kaikoura earthquake happened, so it was very timely. Because of GeoNet, we're able to monitor what's happening on the subduction zone, the part of it that's beneath our feet. But we really are blind to what's happening in the offshore part. And the offshore part is, is really what is the most dangerous part, because when you have subduction zone earthquakes out there, that will displace large portions of the seabed, and that's what generates large tsunami, which is really the greatest concern in terms of potential for loss of life. So back in 2017, a large team of international scientists came together and collected a couple of really important data sets along the Hikarangi margin. 50 ocean bottom seismometers were deployed on the seabed by the Tangaroa. After they were deployed, a second ship sailed over that line and released 9,500 uh, pulses of compressed air. And that produces energy which travels through the earth and is recorded by the ocean bottom seismometers. Previously, before we collected these seismic data sets, the, the only data that we had on the physical properties of the plate boundary were recorded from earthquakes in contrast to seismic data, which enables us to really ramp that up by an order of magnitude. It is like putting your glasses on. Prior to the drilling campaign, we were really inferring a lot of that from regional data, previous drilling from far away. Until the last sort of five years, we haven't had that kind of ground truth information to be able to work with. There's a lot of evidence from not just New Zealand, but also worldwide of seamounts potentially having a part to play in the nature of earthquakes along subduction zones. What we had an opportunity to do was to drill into the top of the seamount to collect samples, to understand the age of it and look at the rock types that would be involved because when those seamounts arrive at the plate interface, they're like a bulge, they're like a pimple on the, on the surface of the downgoing plate and they cause an irregularity in the shape of the fault, because the fault zone has to kind of ride up over any of these high sort of features. And a lot of slow slip activity seems to be located around seamounts that are subducting underneath the outer part of the subduction zone. And we see a similar trend in terms of tremor or other smaller types of earthquakes occurring along other subduction zones where seamounts are sitting underneath the overriding plate. And what a slow slip event or a slow motion earthquake is, is it's very similar to an earthquake. You know, it involves more rapid than normal movement along a plate boundary fault between two pieces of the Earth's crust. But, you know, in an earthquake, that movement happens in a matter of seconds. And you get that sudden seismic energy release and the shaking that you can feel. But these slow motion earthquakes involve a slower movement between the plates, say, tens of centimeters over a period of weeks to months. So it is essentially an earthquake in slow motion. So it's been almost a year since we got back from our big mission on the Tangaroa, uh, New Zealand's research vessel with the remotely operated vehicle from Canada, Ropos. On that mission, we were actually able to plug in to the observatories that we installed, you know, a few years ago. Basically, we were looking at changes in pressure in the, in the crust around the, the borehole, which is telling us about how the Earth's crust is being squeezed and contracted or expanded during these slow slip events. So that's really helping to give us a much fuller picture of the rich array of movement that's happening on the Hikarangi subduction zone that we really had no idea about before. And, and the only way to actually see that is to get up close and personal with the subduction zone 
and be able to kind of monitor those creaks and groans near where the action's happening. We've also been deploying seafloor instruments, ocean bottom seismometers, a variety of other types of seafloor sensors to actually measure upward or downward and horizontal movement of the seafloor during these slow slip events and also between the slow slip events because we want to get a better idea of where the slow motion earthquakes are occurring right now versus also where is the plate boundary locked up offshore and building up stress for future earthquakes. You know, we've learned that these slow motion earthquakes probably go almost all the way right out to the seabed, right out to where the, the subduction zone emerges at the seafloor offshore the east coast. So we've got lots of observations from subduction zones around the world that says that these slow slip events tend to happen in places where we have lots of fluids at depth. We have these slow slip event patches um, happening on the interface and then this is the lower plate coming through, which is where this fluid is being sourced from. We have fluids um, within the sediments and the, the top of the crust, as well as fluids deeper within the crust as well. We've potentially identified a way of, or the physical process behind triggering slip on this megathrust subduction zone. And while in this case it's triggering slip that happens really slowly and doesn't cause a lot of damage, these faults can also host large damaging earthquakes as well, tsunamigenic earthquakes. My study on the Hikurangi subduction zone revolves around understanding where and when past large earthquakes have occurred. So when I say large earthquakes, talking uh, earthquakes bigger than about magnitude 8, so magnitude 8 to 9 sized earthquakes. When we have these really large earthquakes, we can get parts of the coastline will go up by several metres and some parts of the coastline will go down by several metres. So this is an example of the land being uplifted in an earthquake here. And then further down the core, closer to present, we have an example of the land going back down again. What we do is select different macrofossils from each unit depending on the sediment type. So for the peats, this might look something like small twigs, seeds or leaves from the top of the earthquake horizon. Whereas from the silts, it might look something like shell material. Lots of these earthquakes we think have high potential of being subduction earthquakes. So what we're doing here is using really precise radiocarbon dating to create a chronology and a record of these earthquakes. We did a study at Kapara Toho, which is Lake Grasmere over in Marlborough in the South Island. And at that site, we found evidence of two really large tsunamis. One was about 1,500 years old and one was about 2,000 years old. And that's the first time we've been able to calculate what the frequency of large earthquakes on the subduction zone is. The time between these large earthquakes is about 500 years for the southern North Island and the Wellington area. So that was really exciting. The same as we see onshore with these series of sudden events within the changes in sediment, we can locate these as signatures of extensive ground shaking during earthquakes offshore, which produce these turbidity currents. So when we date these, we can try and integrate those two records. Turbidity currents, so that sediment and that water, travel down slope, and then when they reach uh, the lower parts of the canyons, they start depositing sediment. Uh, which we can recognise in sediment cores as turbidites. An underwater canyon is not dissimilar to a river valley. One of the really critical things has been actually being able to test the assumptions that we make to identify a turbidite as being triggered by an earthquake. And the Kaikoura earthquake, which happened in 2016, was the first example globally where we were able to actually trace the triggering of turbidity currents in multiple canyons along the Hikarangi margin, or indeed any margin on Earth, and relate the turbidites formed from those flows with the ground motions produced by the earthquake and indeed the fault rupture itself. The Kaikoura earthquake that happened in 2016, it was a magnitude 7.8 earthquake, and it ruptured a really complex array of, of over a dozen faults in the northern part of the South Island, um, you know, into the area that we're looking here. One of the other things that the Kaikoura earthquake did that has great relevance for the Hikarangi subduction zone is it actually tripped off a sequence of slow motion earthquakes or what we call slow slip events on the Hikarangi subduction zone going from off the northeastern North Island all the way down past Gisborne, Hawke's Bay. 
Our work is predominantly focused on trying to understand the underlying physical processes which are controlling why different parts of the plate boundary are behaving differently. We do know that the southern portion of the plate boundary does have a fairly high likelihood of producing a large earthquake in the next 50 years. One of the big advances we've made in five years is having a better forecast of when the next large subduction earthquake is likely to be in the southern North Island, so sort of underneath our feet where we are here. And we forecast the likelihood of that is about 25% in the next 50 years. So that means in the next 50 years, there's kind of a one in four chance we might have one of these really large earthquakes. So for most of us, definitely our children, that's probably, there's a one in four chance this will happen in our lifetimes. The potential earthquakes on the Hikarangi are probably one of the biggest hazards we've got, the biggest risks to New Zealand and it's also one of the most poorly constrained. It's the one we know the least about. And my main part of my job is the revising the National Seismic Hazard Model, which is a model that gives forecasts of earthquake shaking over the next decades. I think in 2010, which is the last time there was any sort of revision done, there was about 10 potential earthquake scenarios that were considered on the Hikarangi, and in this revision we'll have thousands of different scenarios. The most important thing you can do is actually know your risks because knowledge is power and it helps us make informed choices. As a region, we are isolated. The type of event that Hikarangi will present, it'll be multi-regional. So support, in that essence, won't be a helicopter turning up within 12 hours. We need to be resilient for a period of time. That sort of event would be a real game changer for Hawke's Bay, if not the whole of New Zealand. When the Hikarangi subduction zone inevitably does produce a large earthquake in the future, because it will. We don't know when, but it will at some point in the future, and we need to be ready for that and prepared for that. Prepare your home, protect your whanau. Secure foundations, secure tall and heavy items, including furniture and pictures. Remove unsafe chimneys and make sure your insurance is up to date. In an earthquake, you need to drop, cover and hold. And if the earthquake is long or strong, get gone. Evacuate uphill and out of the tsunami zone. Every step counts.